Are you telling me that the very same thing that we do to assess how bitter something is, is also the same thing that tells us how easily we clear infections like from flu and COVID and other things, but that it can also have anti-cancer properties if even injected to the tumor? I don't believe that it is the holy grail or the fountain of youth, but I do think that this is such an exciting point of medicine that we're on the front end of and research to discover all of these things. Welcome to Target Cancer Podcast. My name is Dr. Sanjay Janeja. I'm a hematologist and medical oncologist, also known as the Onc Doc on social media. And today we have a very special episode, or at least one I'm fascinated in. And I hope it's something you can appreciate because you may or may not have heard, but there was this time period uh, around COVID and people were discussing, does having bitterness sensitivity or how your taste buds uh, respond to certain foods and taste, does it have a measure or outcome on how long you have symptoms for or if you get really sick or not? All things, other things being equal, just with the taste buds alone. And what made me want to do this episode is I've also recently gotten a few posts on social media about the similar concept of T2R, Right, which is like a family of receptors and a lot of times thought of traditionally with taste and bitterness. These posts are saying, hey, if you stimulate T2R, the bitterness, that it may have anti-cancer properties. And so I wanted to nip it in the bud. And to do that and to be able to talk about both things that I find very fascinating, the decision was very easy to have none other than Dr. Henry Barham, who is a rhinologist, which is a subset of ENT. And he knows all kinds of stuff when it relates to like the upper respiratory relationship with the sinuses uh, in the oropharynx and the nasal cavities. He was actually published in JAMA, one of the thousands of publications that he has, uh, where he reported outcomes with bitterness tasting and what happened when healthcare workers uh, had COVID and whether they were like, you know, strong, bitter, sensitive people versus those that couldn't taste it and what those outcomes were. But for that reason, as well as the relation to cancer and so many more, because he's just a very cool guy, uh, I am going to bring in Dr. Henry Barham. Henry, it is such an honor and so exciting to have you. No, thank you so much. This is this is really exciting. Obviously, you know, um, have become friends with Dr. Janajan, so couldn't be couldn't be more excited to talk about this and just with him in general. So thank you. Yeah, of course, it's almost overdue and. You know, I appreciate every time I text you, I'm like, hey, what do they say about this when it relates to cancer? And, and you always give me the cleanest and most academic, uh, but understandable explanation. So with that said, let's go ahead and start this episode with just that, where there's this news circulating that's stimulating T2R, um, classically thought of uh, the family for bitterness, can actually have an outcome measurement of cancer control, if not resolution. Can you break down how that may be the case and if it's related to the immune system or some other way? Where did we kind of get this uh, conclusion? Yeah, no. So, I mean, there that's kind of a big question or a big answer. Um, T2Rs in general are a fascinating part of medicine. I am incredibly biased uh, to say that. I admit that, but it, it is my kind of point of study. Um, as he said, I'm a rhinologist, and so I completed ENT and then did a fellowship in rhinology. And so I really, uh, my practice consists of diseases of the nose, sinus, skull base, so pituitary tumors, orbital tumors, tumors um, in of the head and neck. Um, but I have studied T2Rs and solitary chemosensory cells, which is a cell that T2Rs live on um, for a while now, dating back to 2011. Um, you know, the, the interesting part, or I think the, the question you're asking is uh, something we talked about recently. There was a study that came out in 2022 at a University of Pennsylvania, um, and they were looking specifically at lidocaine in head and neck cancers, and they actually showed that lidocaine, they found the way that it actually happened, but lidocaine caused a stimulation of T2R14, which then led to cellular death in head and neck cancers. Um, they were also able to isolate how it did that specifically. And so that really was mitochondrial calcium overload, um, but also proteasome inhibition. Um, and so it, it really is kind of a fascinating point of topic because 
I study these receptors more as they relate to immunity. So specifically, he referenced the paper in JAMA. We've studied these receptors really as they relate to, to um, inflammatory diseases and bacterial infections in the sinuses. So people get sinus infections, right? And so um, TTR levels appears to be correlative of people's outcomes to sinusitis. Well, then during COVID, we started looking at them as you know, predictor. So people with high expression of these receptors uh, tended to have less severe illness. And those with low expression of these receptors uh, tended to have, you know, COVID more frequently and worse illness. And we published that in JAMA. But, you know, now we've continued to study it to not just COVID, but to upper respiratory infections in general, whether it be influenza or RSV, um, and then even targeted therapies of those. So, you know, I referenced the, the PIN group, um, we did a study during COVID of using a nasal spray to stimulate the receptors as a prophylactic against COVID, um, which also would extrapolate into other respiratory infections. So, and so that's why, you know, I'm really excited about this topic because it, it is potentially such a great future in medicine. So, you know, it's, it's now been shown to head and neck cancers, upper respiratory infections, bacterial infections, inflammatory disorders. And so it's a, it's just a fascinating part of medicine, honestly. Yeah, no doubt. And there's already so much there to break down. But, you know, I read that publication in JAMA and if, if you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but as I understood it, it's basically like one out of four Americans will be at least born with the ability to be very sensitive to bitterness, which means kind of that higher expression of whatever that T2R receptor is that 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 perceives the bitterness. And then one out of four, it's like Mendelian genetics, will will be pretty blunted. Like they really just don't have that uh, that much bitterness taste receptor stuff. And then fifty percent of Americans will be somewhere in between. And if I recall correctly, all other things being equal, you looked at employees that had not had COVID. This was the beginning, and then you know you kind of saw what happened. And the super tasters had something like three, four days of reported symptoms after COVID. But if you had an apple to apple same, you know, for me, somebody in their 30s, oncologist, like, you know, no major comorbid, you know, problems. It was 26 to 27 days if they were non taste like literally based on an assessment made before they had COVID because you're born with that distribution on your tongue. It can change, but at least the genetics on on the ability to be super taster. And that in itself is wild. And that, as I understood it, is because that gong that says bitter, 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 and you can, you know, kind of picture the the waves going on the bitterness, it's also the same thing that triggers the gong for innate immunity. And the stuff that really, the pawns in the chessboard that clear stuff out of the nasal stuff and out of the mouth and 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 do all the upfront work that aren't necessarily the snipers, you know, antibodies and all this, they don't have to have exposure before. They just do what they do. They know how to clear that stuff up. And the supertaceous generally don't have recurrent, you know, sinusitis, things, uh, or sinus problems they're usually picky and don't like you know strong or black coffee and things like that and we're going to talk about all that later but all of that as far as the immune part goes uh being a gong with bitterness sensitivity as i understand it when you're talking about the lidocaine and the anti-cancer property because we've talked a lot on this podcast about immune health and potentially better cancer outcomes and maybe you can tell me that there's a relation there that that's second hand that the lidocaine was stimulating T2R and causing cellular death also from the immune cells that were like being recruited there? Or is it on now a different mechanism that just causes it to blow up? Appears to be a different mechanism. I mean, yeah, you you just touched on a lot, which is which is fantastic because that that's the whole point of these receptors that is so exciting. So they're called taste receptors, right? So you really, um, you have T2R receptors, which is a bitter receptor. You have a T1R, which is a sweet receptor. But um, T2Rs, we'll take them specifically because that's what this is really about, but they're called bitter taste receptors, right? Well, because they do influence taste. Well, if you think about that, like on a, on mammals in nature, the, we as humans don't behave like them because, you know, things in, in nature or mammals are never going to intentionally eat something that is bitter because most things in nature that are bitter are potential pathogens. They're harmful. And so it produces that noxious or that kind of painful, aversive response to stay away from it. So that's kind of the, the rudimentary part of these receptors is they are part of your protection. But then when you get into innate immunity, as you talk about, you know, your, our immune system really is, 
it's it's a physical uh, you know immunity but then you also have the chemical which is really innate immunity and adaptive immunity these really reside in the in innate immunity and so as you touched on basically you know when these receptors are stimulated in the sinonasal tract in the oral mucosa um, when they're stimulated by a potential pathogen whether it be a virus a bacteria a fungus or you know cancer cells is sort of the, the new um, target that we're looking at um, they do several things so some of those are they as you referenced in the sinus tract is they increase mucociliary clearance and so they will increase ciliary beat frequency and mucus production to sort of sweep things away to get the the pathogen out of there but then also one of their byproducts is nitric oxide which is really where we had the idea behind covid because it looked like that that nitric oxide prevented maturation of the spike protein so that was sort of the idea of people with high expression should in theory have less of a response and using targeted prophylaxis to stimulate the receptors as a response to prevent uh, upper respiratory infections um but the 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 ability of these receptors to contribute to immunity is just so impressive because it it influences taste as an aversion but then there's also this chemical response that is protective um, both um, prophylactically but now it also looks like based on the pen study at literally killing off cancer cells and that is that's so fascinating it is i mean it, it blows my mind and so that chemical response, that innate chemical response when this gong is hit, that is what's also, you know, at, on the Penn study sh- suggesting that that's what's causing the cellular death because of the cascade of events, if you will, that happen now, not necessarily taste because it's on your tongue, but just, you know, in the region uh, is is kind of catalyzing this process. So did they inject the lidocaine? What did they give it? Like, how did that how did that happen? Yeah, that's what that's what they do. It's mainly it's the head and neck group there that's doing it. And it, it's a I mean, it's a beautiful study and a beautiful finding because the you know, lidocaine is is you know, something that we use in medicine and it's readily available and it's it's not terribly expensive. Um, but it you know, if it if it does in fact stimulate T two R fourteen causing cellular death and head and neck cancers, the potential for that is just enormous. We pardon this interruption real quick. If you're enjoying this podcast or find it valuable for what we discuss and the education and how people see and think about cancer in general, we would very much appreciate a like, subscribe, and especially a share so we can bring that information as maximally and broadly as possible. Thank you so much for listening. Do other tumors, as far as you know, like cancer tumors express uh, G2R14? Yeah, they were they were one of the first in the head and neck to show to show that it, you know T2Rs have been studied. So they're this is something we've talked about previously, but they are they're not isolated to the respiratory tract. As you referenced earlier, it is a family of you know around twenty five known bitter taste receptors, and we have them throughout. So they're in the brain, they're in the gut, they're in the respiratory tract, they're in the thyroid. They're I mean they're they're spread in in many locations, and there there have been studies you know that I've shouldn't speak on because it's not my expertise, but, you know, looking at gut uh, health, looking at even longevity. So uh, level of expression of these receptors, you know, showed outcomes to overall longevity. And so the, I do think it's a, a potentially just fascinating field of study that that I'm very fortunate to be able to study. But, you know, I'm not alone. There's places all around the world that are doing great work on this. For sure. And I, you know, it's just crazy to think of something so simple. I mean, that's what I've really appreciated over the evolution of this podcast is it really is a lot about going back to the basics. Like we got so kind of advanced with, you know, and it's very important molecular and targeted therapies that are kind of downstream and then how sciencey and techy can you get to go target it? But we've also had a lot of, you know, stuff on, on metabolic health. Like what is at the, at the simple biology of the cancer? How is it just being alive? Where's this fuel source coming from? And then we talk about immune health and how, you know, that was such a, I hate to call it a game changer because it almost, you know, is, it's not as sensitive because it's such a serious thing, but it, it changed everything so dramatically. And it really taps back into something that we have always known that the immune system is important in cancer. But in that case, we're talking about, you know, lymphocytes and, um, and T cell stuff, but this is something we're talking about for the first time, which is that chemical, um, relationship of 
something that we know is very important. I think I read somewhere that you had a study looking at T2R in dogs. And basically, I think, I don't recall if it was a different interview that you were on, where you were discussing why do dogs, how do they know what to eat, what not to eat? How come they can eat a lot of sketchy stuff like on the street and not get as sick as we do? And how come they're considered to have, I think, cleaner mouths or like cleaner health than us? And and that's where it started. That whole track of, of thinking is a very relevant one, um, but it's in a different immune system kind of way. And so what you were doing, just so people are clear, is that you were looking into stimulating those receptors in the nasal pharynx, like the basically when you take a deep breath and then everything <clears throat> that goes down into the posterior part of your of your oral cavity, you were stimulating or kind of banging that gong to almost prepare them for possibly viral entry from flu, COVID, et cetera. And the, and the neat thing is it doesn't sound like it's at all unique to COVID. There was just a big need to really figure this out right at that time, yeah. but that it that it kind of relates to keeping things out of the blood system and kind of getting them out as soon as they walk in the door, so to speak. Yeah, no, I mean, you nailed it. Like when you look at, I find the the entire immune system fascinating as, as most people do, but um, it's so complex. But most of the time when we talk about the immune system, people are really talking about adaptive immunity. And so, you know, whether you have vaccines or, you know, some of the new biologics, um, th those are really targeting blood-borne immunity and adaptive and memory immunity. The, the beautiful part of this project is the innate immune system. Uh, I don't want to say that I'm excited that it's it's finally getting its, uh, its pedestal or, or someone promoting it, but, you know, it's always kind of been regarded in my mind when I went through training and, and learned about it as kind of the the poor man's version of immunity, I guess. It, it, I hate to put it that way, but um, just not that exciting because it's it's rudimentary, it's non-specific. Um, but but that's what's really cool about this project is because it is non-specific. So exactly what you're talking about, it's not isolated to COVID. It's not isolated to flu. Now the Penn study, it's not isolated to just one specific head and neck, you know, cell uh, cancer cell line because it is nonspecific, it's great that it's on the surface because it's much easier to target. And so whether it be a nasal spray that's not systemic or an oral spray that's not systemic, those are fascinating because you can get such an incredible response without systemic effects. And that's a that's an incredible part, you know, or potential future in medicine that that I, I realize I'm probably getting too excited about this, but but it's just, it's a great time to to research this. That would be my, my takeaway on it. No, I love it. And I'm going to say this, and maybe it's, you know, something you're going to shy away from, but I read somewhere that there was this, you know, if social media taught me one thing, it's to have grace and at least look for the validity and things that you want to dismiss as a medical professional out the gates, right? Like we know things get hyperbolic and extreme, but I believe that more often than not, there's a seed of truth to something. And there was this time period where this whole thought of hydroxychloroquine really helping with COVID and COVID clearance, right? And um, and the data, people tried to look at it and it was a little conflicting. And one thing I noticed was that in an outpatient setting, meaning like you're not sick, right? You're not like actually in the yeah. hospital from viremia or like a septic viremia. But that the, the this suggestion was, well, if you took hydroxychloroquine, you're less likely to get super sick from COVID. And I need to say that with viral illnesses, that's the key. Is, is That's why we say you can be asymptomatic or no symptoms and carry flu, and that's why you need a vaccine, is because you can have it in your nasal, you know, bearing stuff, your head and neck, before it goes into your blood and turns into this big, big septic thing. I read the consideration that maybe people were doing better and not getting so, you know, septic viremia with taking hydroxychloroquine, not because of the hydroxychloroquine, but the quinine, which apparently is a stimulus in your oropharynx, which there's a ton of data of the four that helps trigger that innate immunity. And the reason that it got investigated and was like, oh no, maybe it doesn't help, is then when they were trying to give it to people that were already admitted, and actually now it's past the 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 nasopharyngeal area and it's it is sepsis, viral sepsis, and they're already crashing. Then you try it and it's almost like, oh, not only does it not help, it may make it worse. But at that point, if you're going by the T2R concept, at that point, it's already past the, the, the moat or the castle gate, you know, like it's already in 
And then obviously hydroxychloroquine downregulates your immune system in, in other ways. And maybe that was more problematic, but at least I'm going to go out on a limb here, you know, boldly and say that makes sense. Again, at least with the science part on why in one circumstance it makes sense because it clears it before it's in and infiltrating and then why maybe the studies were discrepant. I don't know if you can get yeah. a comment on that, but. No, no. I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating point uh, or question. Um, and I would actually follow it up with another one that I think makes it even more intriguing is, you know, if in, cause we, we've published several studies. The biggest one that we've referenced is the JAMA one, but, or um, that was published in JAMA. If, you know, if 86% of those requiring hospitalization in the first place showed low to no level expression of T2Rs, then if it is a quinine base, you're not going to have the receptors to stimulate versus those in the outpatient setting with high expression of T2Rs are going to have a more response right. if that's the mechanism of how it's working in the first place. Yes. And that's, and that's, a, that's a speculative point, but I mean, it is fascinating if that's were to be true. No, I mean, it makes perfect sense. Like you have to have the ability to receive a message to, for that message to mean anything, right? Like if you're shouting, right. like, get out of here, it, it's dangerous. Like we have these little alerts in our hospital, but if someone's deaf, it doesn't do anything. That's why they usually have right. a flash. And so yep. what you're saying is, and now I'm, I remember that statistic, when you looked at, I just want people to understand this. When you looked at and categorized people based on a taste test of a couple of strips, you know, they don't have T2R, they can't taste bitterness. They love black coffee. They flex that they drink black coffee and super, you know, tannin based wines and hard liquors. It doesn't bother them. And then, and then the super tasters are like, I just, I can't, I can't get on board with black coffee because it's very further, right? The taste. Yeah. And that's because you have a high expression of it. And so obviously when you were saying this 86%, that's what turned out to be the case of people that needed admission, even though quarter were non-tasters, a quarter were super tasters, 86% of the people that was admitted way disproportionately. Well, what we did, no, it actually, the stat was, was even more is of those requiring admission, almost 90% were in the non-taster or that's, the low expression. Even though group. that's only 25% of, of the distribution. And yeah, right. And the remainder, this is, it wasn't 100%, obviously, nothing is in medicine, but the remainder were actually in the heterozygous for a functional receptor, so sort of that middle group or the taster group. But the average age of those was 65 requiring admission. And one thing we do know is these receptors decrease as you get older. And so just like your palate changes when you're a child, you give them broccoli and they're detest it and want nothing to do with it. As you get older, your palate evolves. Part of that is your phenotypic expression of these receptors does decrease with age. And so that was kind of the, the telling point there is that of those requiring hospital admission, you know, almost 90% were in the non taster group. And of the group of the, the rest that were not, none were in the super taster group. They were in the taster group and they were an average age of 65 or older. Based on this, one of my favorite questions that I forget to ask and I want to start asking it again is when you meet a couple and one was floored like three weeks. So like, you know, my wife and my husband, long haul COVID, three and a half weeks, four to six weeks. And then the other one's like, and, and my wife or my husband didn't even get sick for two days, like maybe some fatigue. I love seeing the expression on their face. When I said, I bet you yeah. drink black coffee every morning and you hate black coffee. And they're just like, what? Yes. And I bet you like can drink hard liquor or or you like cabs because those are generally more bitter and you like like, you know, blushes and, and, and sweeter. And they're just looking at me like, where are like, you sorcerer? Where did that come from? And I'm like, because Good. the data is very strong that if you have a bitterness sensitivity or high expression that you have less, less admissions. Now, you know, and I hope I'm not kind of pinning you on this one but i did find that so i found your test i don't know if you know that and and that really blew my mind this whole concept of how one something that also triggers the innate immunity and and kind of this preventative stuff for viruses that can enter and cause problems you could actually directly relate that to your taste preferences so I took this, like the four strips, when I read your publication, I ordered some on Amazon and I had to spit the third strip out. Like literally I was like, it's so bitter. And so in with the fourth one, whatever this kit was. And then my wife, like she, the third one was like paper. She didn't even taste it. And then the fourth one was kind of mild. And then I found out much later that you were trying to relate this to like, you know, uh, 
the industry on taste preference even just just to give people a community social thing to do and when i related what strips i didn't like and what she did like i felt vindicated because all of a sudden i'm like that's why i don't like cabs it's not because i'm uncool and i'm not like somebody that doesn't know enough it's like i am a strong taster and it, it told me specifically i think you're you have um you basically have the science behind something called vino taster where it tells you what your expression is and how much and gives you this card on like this is what you like this is what you probably dislike and they were literally exactly what existed for my wife and i based on the discrepancies in our taste and the fact though that that can also occur for immunity and your ability to clear infection is one that i just don't think people are appreciating enough i mean that's that the same way that some people hate things and other people like it that could also be the reason for the person who says i never get sick versus i get a cold every season yeah no it's been fascinating I, you know um as you referenced vino taster is the the new project that we've been working on and it's 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 kind of a play on words but vino is like wine and then taster is t-a-s-t-r because the receptors that we're we're studying is t-a-s-1-r and t-a-s-2-r so that's why it's t-a-s-t-r um is v-i-n-o-t-a-s i I love a fellow nerd i love yeah Um, but it's but it's fascinating so the idea was is like i wonder if you know because this is something that we just haven't done that to me is is so fascinating because i love the immunity part of it but then the question was like what if you could literally taste or test people's taste and then match them for preferences. Um, and this has been a fantastic project because, um, it is, you know, it, it launched recently and it's been really fun because as you reference, it's a fun project or it's a front fun test to take, uh, just with your friends. And it is, it, it's, it's been crazy accurate, but it, I mean, it shouldn't be surprising because it's literally testing people's taste receptors, um, for their, you know, taste sensitivity. But yeah, you, you take a test. It then we worked with different um, people in the wine industry from producers to distributors. Um, and, and yeah, you take a test and then right then and there, it gives you your results and it makes recommendations of your wine, uh, of wine recommendations tailored specific to you. And then we've also set it up to where you can order the wine directly off of the app uh, that comes to you also. And so we, the whole point was, you know, and this was kind of, make it easy if that's that's the beauty of these is they're so simplistic and and wine we have found is is intimidating it seems like most people buy wine the same way they walk into a store they see 10,000 bottles they get overwhelmed and they buy a label that looks cool that's in their price point and they hope it doesn't stink they hope that they like it or they can you know give it to a friend and they think it's okay but you know the the our goal was to kind of take the mystery out of it or the intimidation out of it because if it's 2024 and we have the ability to measure your taste receptors, well, then we should be able to do something with that. We go with that. And so that's been the beauty of this is like, you can literally do one test that measures, you know, we figured out which specific taste receptors matter for tannins in wine and then which re- specific T1Rs of the sweet receptors matter for residual sugar. And so that's really what it's measuring is it's measuring basically your expression of those different receptors and then it's creating your preference based on that. And then the the industry has helped us curate wine recommendations based on your specific taste profile. And so that's been really fun. We've actually done it to wine, beer, spirits, cannabis, coffee, tea, chocolate, kind of generalized food product. And so there's, it's been a really fun project. You've done it for all of the things that usually are an area of debate. It's like, I like this wine, I like this barbecue, I like this tequila. And I mean, again, you're, when you say it, it just makes so much sense. You're going to find things unpleasantly bitter if your bitter taster is on I, like it's on 10 out of 10. Like it's, you're, you're more likely to find something unpleasant than somebody that has a level two out of 10 on sensitivity. And so they can tolerate and maybe even prefer more because their sweet, you know, receptors are higher. Is that, is yeah. that a sliding scale? Is it like 80, you know, percent bitterness sensitivity and 20% sugar or sweet sensitivity and that you can't have, like, is it, is there a limitation? Like, can you have a lot of sweet receptor and bitter receptor? You can, I mean, in general, the two oppose each other. So upregulation of T2R inherently will cause a downregulation of T1R and vice versa. Um, However, you know, since we threw all of the trials and then now Vino Taster, um, 
we've been, you know, we have a lot of data, which is fantastic. And it, you know, people ask like, what do you believe on a certain topic? I believe in science and I believe in data. And those two are going to tell you the answer, right? The data has been, has, you know, as we said, they do kind of oppose each other, but there are groups that do remain very high in both of them. And that's been kind of the fun part of, of figuring out like, how do you match them specifically? Because that's a group that, um, does tend to be overwhelmed or, you know, like here, here's a, here's an example that, that I find fascinating. And we sort of touched on this, but the reason this is so exciting for me is that it's literally the, the front end of an entire neurosensory system, meaning using taste for something in real life, analogous to vision. So like you can take 10 people or, you know, years ago, you could have taken 10 people to the Grand Canyon and you put them all there and they can realize that it's a big hole and it, you know, it seems to be impressive, but until you measure, you know, their eyes specifically and then match glasses for them, that's when they get this full sensory experience. Well, take taste. There's no way that if 10 people go to dinner together, that they all have the same exact taste receptors. And so it's crazy that they would all sit down and, and someone would come and say, you need to try this bottle of wine because it's going to be, you're all going to love it. I mean, we just have different taste receptors. We just do. It's the science of it. And so like this, that's, what's been really exciting is like people can now take a test, figure out exactly as which match for them. And it's like the wine becomes the eyeglasses. It really opens up this like sensory experience. And then you get in, obviously I'm kind of crazy about smell. Also, we've been touching on taste because of T2Rs, but it just opens up the experience so much more when it's tailored for them. And that's been really exciting. That's, that's wild. Now, in, on that same note, <clears throat> bridging the two, I want to ask a question that may be almost ignorantly too simple, but if I say that it's a bad, you know, viral season, you already said that there are sprays and stuff you can do to stimulate these receptors. Does it make theoretical sense for me to maybe increase the stimulation frequency of my bitterness receptors during, you know, a party where there's going to be a lot of people and possibly sick? Like, am I almost creating this, like, you know, the superheroes have this little, like, shield that goes around them or in the video games and things bounce off for a little while. If I'm just sipping on say like a very heavy tannin wine or black coffee during that party, theoretically, am I having more of my, you know, army reserves mobilized, you know, to the Gulf? I live in the Gulf and you sometimes you have to prepare for things like, is that what's happening theoretically? Yeah. I mean, it's a great question in, and I'm going to answer it in two ways. So your, your thought is right on, meaning that's exactly the, the trial that we did, you know, that I was involved with, with University of Pennsylvania of a nasal spray as a prophylactic against COVID during the kind of heart of COVID when it was really going on. It's not as simplistic as the coffee or the, the, um, wine analogy, because there are, you know, the, the family, as we referenced earlier, has, you know, 25 or so known bitter taste receptors and they all, you know, either live in different locations through your respiratory tract or your gut. And they have different stimulants. It's not like you can just say, hey, drink this black coffee and you're stimulating all 25. It just doesn't work that way. And so that was kind of the fascinating point, about, fascinating point behind the pen cancer study or head and neck cancer studies. They showed that lidocaine stimulates T2R14. So really, you know, yes, coffee does stimulate some of the receptors, but but not like raising your your shield up to where all of it's good. But But that's kind of what we're exploring with the different nasal sprays is, how do you create something that is tolerable, um, doesn't cause side effects, doesn't cause systemic absorption, but you get still get a broad stimulation of the specific receptors that matter most in the innate immune response, if that answers your question. No, it does. It, it very well does. And now I thought of another one, which I think maybe even, you know, a, a more ignorant question. Well, actually, maybe it answers the question I had was just answered by what you said, because when you get infected with a virus, you're obviously not tasting bitterness. So there's other constituents of that virus and that, that it's entry that goes in that somehow stimulates T2. It's not like you taste bitter and you're like, oh man, I'm sick because I haven't like, you know, eaten anything bitter. 
it's obviously kind of a, a, a neighboring phenomenon. What is it, you know, and again, pardon my ignorance, about the virus that kind of turns on or, or catalyzes this process of clearance? Obviously, it's probably evolutionary in the sense that those people did not die of viruses as much if they had the sensitivity to features of the virus itself. Yeah, I, there's probably two answers there. Uh, number one, you touching on you don't taste with a virus or taste of bitterness with a virus. You know, the there is good data that, you know, we can pick up virions or, you know, vi- viral particles from from different sources. But one of the primary mechanisms of delivery is is through our nose, right? Um, not necessarily through our mouth. Yes, you can get it also through your mouth. But a common thing that we do, th- this is a whole other topic on, on smell, but a, a common reaction actually that humans do is when you shake hands, um, when you come into contact with some people. It, it's actually very common to, to touch your nose after, which you may not even realize that you're doing it. There's theories there of whether we're trying to pick up pheromones uh, to sort of group that person. I, there's a I, we can do a whole other podcast on that. I, I'm not going to bore the crowd uh, with that. But no, no, um, no. Tell me some more. What are some other? That, that, that's a that's a very uh, common um, sort of mechanism that humans do is when when you're in a room with someone. Um, or a common deal you actually don't realize you do is you touch your eyes and you touch your nose actually fairly frequently which it appears to be one of the common ways that you can spread a virus is, is through nasal entry. Um, but to your specific question, stimulation of the receptors in the nose is not necessarily going to stimulate a taste response, if that makes sense. And so these receptors live on ciliated epithelial cells and solitary chemosensory cells. It's really the specific ones in the mouth that cause the taste response. Taste and smell is pretty complex in that, you know, most people say, oh, take COVID for instance, most people say, well, I lost my taste and smell. But most of them actually lost their smell. Flavor is retronasal smell, um, as opposed to like true cardinal taste is really just five taste receptors on your tongue. But most of flavor or the differentiating subtle differences is really retronasal smell. And so you're not gonna necessarily taste something that is stimulated, that causes stimulation of the receptors in your nose. But to answer your specific question, that that is one of the beauty of these receptors is because they're part of the innate immune response, they sort of recognize most things that are foreign to cause the reaction of increasing mucociliary clearance and mucus production and nitrous, nitric oxide production to clear it um, because it because the innate immune system, as you well know, is is non-specific. It just re- recognizes as non-self or something that, you know, it's foreign to us. And so that's how it sort of stimulates that response. Here's a somewhat, I keep saying this, but like somewhat of an embarrassing question that I've never shared with anyone ever. So this is happening for the first time. Here we go. And it's with you <laughs> that I just am so fascinated by and such a fan of. Sometimes I swear I can smell like when, you know, I have patients that are on therapy and all this stuff. I can, I feel like I can smell almost this metallic taste or something when somebody has coughed or sneezed versus other times when they had, when it's, you know, not viremia. And again, I'm so, so embarrassed that I'm asking this, but is there any suggestion that people that are sensitive to smell and maybe have high T2 expression, because I, I, I am one of those fortunate people that don't get sick. I feel like I can smell a different character in that breathing, especially when I'm doing my you know physical exam with my stethoscope and I'm close. Um, this was like, especially before the mask masking, uh, regularity era. Is that a thing or am I just smelling the byproducts of probably a bacterial infection on the men? That's kind of that, you know, immune system. I think that's proud. This, the latter is probably more likely, but it is something that, that has been looked into. It's a, it's a little more complicated because we're, you know, you're talking about T2Rs and that's, you know, you know, that you have high expression, at least of, of certain ones that we've tested, uh, prior to this podcast. But, um, what you're referencing is more their smell that that's, and that's literally smell. So it's, it's kind of a different, uh, mechanism or a different neural transmission pathway. Um, but I, I think it's probably the latter that you're, that you're actually smelling something. Gotcha. That's so, I remember I went on this. It's fascinating. Deep, yeah, very much so. Um, I went on this deep rabbit hole a few years back, uh, on body language. I was obsessed. I read everything on it. And so I'm, I'm actually very familiar with that um, whole covering the mouth um, 
and and face after an introduction. Also, when not an introduction and you're walking across a ballroom with a ton of people and everyone's going to see you, how you tend to kind of cover across your chest. You might hold your purse, you know, across the chest, yeah. even though it doesn't need to be held or or something of that nature, hold your phone. And that's because the theory is that it protects your, naturally protects your visceral organs because that's why dogs will lay over and expose their belly to say, yo, I'm, you know, I'm being beta to you because this is the easiest way to access, you know, vitality and, and the cessation of, of vitality. But I read that I like the pheromone theory because that is natural, right? Like it's a very kind of evolutionary thing just with animals in general. I read that it was mostly uh, an inherent kind of hiding of our thoughts, uh, immediate thoughts, because obviously we share our reactions on our face and stuff. And it's a subconscious way of basically not wanting to expose oneself and their own feelings about something. And, and, and they're trying to hold the cars to the chest, whether it's on a date or whether it's you know, your boss or whatever, but I don't know. Do you have any other theories besides those two? Yeah. I mean, it's look, I, I think it's probably so complex, uh, that we're not going to knock it all out here, but, um, you know, even like in my world or in the nose, um, we have Jacobson's organ or the vulnerable nasal pit sort of, uh, I don't know if you know much about that, but it's, it's, um, presumed to be not really functional in humans. Um, but it's a fascinating, uh, whether it be vestigial organ or, or an organ that we don't really use as much anymore in humans. I, I'm actually doing a study on it right now um, because there there is certainly evidence in other mammals, non-human mammals that you know they certainly use them. So for for mating, you know, you reference a dog, but a dog sniffing another dog, they're they're literally picking up pheromones. Um, you know, there's, there's a study of, of mice with basically a Bruce phenomenon or Bruce effect where, um, my female pregnant female mice will abort the pregnancy if they're exposed and basically early in the pregnancy exposed to pheromones from the non-father male. So if the, if all of the pheromones of the father or the male partner um, in the pregnancy is taken away and then the female is exposed to um, another male's pheromones, she will with great frequency abort the pregnancy. And that's incredibly fascinating um, and an area that we're looking, you know, at now into, which is probably also, I keep going on topics or, you know, uh, side side topics that are probably beyond the scope of this talk, but but a fascinating point of study looking at you know in humans is that is it still active does it correlate with um sexual affinity or sexual activity um and drive and then does it influence pregnancies um, or spontaneous abortions and so those are some of the things that that we're looking at now which is another kind of fascinating topic i'm gonna ask this and 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 then this is the last one on that tangent because you know in respect to the the, the core we'll the conversation, answer. but <laughs> is there data that shows that male mice have hostility or antagonism if they smell a young baby or whatever of a mouse that has different pheromones? Yeah. So that's, that's that. Sorry. I should have touched on that. That's kind of the idea I of assume that. why, <laughs> yeah, of why they will abort because in, in the, in, in nature, if the male partner in the pregnancy is not available anymore. Um, the expectation is that the new male will kill the babies when they are born. And so the mother, their whole goal is to breed and to produce offspring is to abort that pregnancy, to move on to another pregnancy because the survival of that pregnancy is, is minimal. Um, if there is another male involved. And so that's kind of the, that was the theory of why they abort in the first place. They actually took it a step further to basically, they basically burned or cauterized the, the Jacobson's organ and they did not spontaneously abort, um, on the same level that they did prior to. So it's, it's a fascinating point. We can go back to the cancer deal. That just a, a teaser for future studies. Yeah. That's so, so interesting. Okay. Wow. Okay. One of the other things that I was thinking about before this podcast is we know that generally, and I, and I hate this, I I wish it wasn't the case, but when you have risk factors for people that don't do well with like a pandemic and things like that, you know, we always talk about 
the immune system that wanes or is compromised with age, right? So like the, that's one of the reasons when other than, you know, cardio, you know, cardiovascular or cardio adrenergic reserve is less and all this, they say the elderly are generally more immune compromised. And there's many reasons for this, um, you know, stuff that relates to the thymus and T cell developments and then B cells and antibodies. And all of those are pathways that I can appreciate, you know, go down over time. And we know you need those things to um, to combat early cancers and, and things like that. Is there a theory that as one ages, because in general, their taste receptors, which I think it's not just the T2R, but signify other receptors. You said there's like, you know, 12 in the naso oral area thing. Like, I assume that if we know that the bitterness and the other things are getting blunted, is there a theory that that same phenomenon is also now a reason for the innate immunity to be waning as people age? And maybe even if I am, if I'm bold enough to say why kids generally bounce back and do clear infections because they have a potent amount of these receptors uh, because generally taste wanes over time? Yeah, certainly uh, something that needs to be studied more in full, but you're, you're exactly right. That was kind of one of the takeaways from our big study. So we, you know, what we did in our in our COVID study is we tested you know nearly two thousand subjects or nineteen hundred something subjects so um, and then followed them and those we we risk stratified uh, looking at comorbidities and things like that and then uh, and age um, and sex and the final results what we wanted to see was independent of any other risk factors. So even if you pull all of those out and you only analyze it based on T2R status, we still showed the outcomes of worse, you know, increased risk of infection, increased risk of worsened illness uh, or a more difficult illness in the group with low expression. Now, that's a complicated um, answer that seems simplistic because overall health status will also impact your expression of the receptors. And so like your diet influences the receptors, as you referenced earlier, we're drinking a bunch of black coffee and things like that. You know, foods high in fats and sugars and things like that are going to tend to decrease your expression of T2Rs. And so um, we did want to analyze the data just looking, you know, at T2R status independent of all other variables knowing that all of those other variables do influence the expression of T2R. You basically removed all the other things that we know also affect that. Like you said, I'm sure diabetes affects the amount of, you know, we know it causes neuropathy. illness. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. The reason I wanted to ask that was because of what I think is an important consideration if it's one to be made. And that's that a lot of our chemotherapies affect the mouth one of the most common things and taste that we get that breaks my heart because i don't have a lot of solutions to be quite honest uh is i just can't nothing tastes good or it tastes awful and everything tastes like metal or i can't taste anything now that's definitely a phenomenon with radiation obviously to the head and neck area because that's direct sure you know uv damage not uv whatever radiation damage but then the thing i don't love especially thinking this way about what we just discussed on maybe taste and all of those other features in the mucosa, in the oral mucosa and the naso oral mucosa, if those are waning or sustain a big insult with chemotherapy, this is a two-part question. Number one, which I think I know the answer to is, I always tell patients they're immune compromised. If they're getting chemotherapy really hard and their white count is going down, but specifically their neutrophils or their granulocytes, they often look like they're, wait, you know, easily get a get an infection, right? That's the one where you want to do antibiotics if the neutrophils are, you know, less than four or five hundred, because you just don't have enough defense cells to clear bacterial infection. No. And then the way I talk to my lymphoma patients are the ones that have to do with antibody stuff, like plasma cells, and and they're using that MABs, you know, rituximab and all this stuff. I'm like, you're not going to look sick, you're not going to look immune compromised, but your adaptive immunity which has to do with like vaccines and and things with viruses i'm like they can hurt you and opportunistic infections that otherwise wouldn't bother you so those are two different kinds of immune compromise yeah my question is 
during chemotherapy is, I guess the answer is yes. One, it sounds like another reason is even the innate immunity. So whether they're on antibody stuff for the lymphocytic or lymphocyte lineage, or whether they're on stuff for the neutrophil granulocyte, regular cytotoxic general chemotherapy, both of them like will share if they're losing taste with certain regimens, also a compromise of their innate immunity. But my bigger concern is what about the long term? What about when it never recovers or it's always blunted? That concerns me. Yep. Um, no, yeah, great, great point of, or great question. Um, and I'll answer it this way. So um, as part of Taster Labs, which is really what controls um, all of the, the projects that we've been working on, whether it be Vino Taster, Barrel Taster for bourbon, in the background of those, so we have the protocol written and plan to start this trial um, soon. What we're looking at is generalized taste tests in that population, exactly. Because the reason in my mind that it's most important is you have a population that is so incredibly dependent on caloric intake. And as you said, they just don't know what they like anymore because their taste changes. And that's frustrating because they don't really have an answer. As an oncologist, you're the one counseling them because they're your patient. You may not have the answer. And so that's exactly the, what we're planning on looking into is how exactly do, do their taste receptors change both from a taste perception, but also from a native immune response uh, influence. How do those change? And then how can you, number one, tailor diets based on their new, where they are on phenotypic expression of taste receptors to tailor a diet for them so that they can get the caloric intake. Cause most of them, I mean, you ask when they, when they downregulate T2Rs, they'll, they'll, the one thing they can still eat a lot of times is sweet things. Right. Um, and that's just an upregulation of T1R, but it's probably not the best thing to eat while you're going through chemotherapy. If it's the only thing you, you like. And so that's where we're trying to collect the data to then curate diets based on their results to help these people through it in addition to looking in the immune response of the taste receptors that changes yeah i mean that's incredible those are two different capacities one you know theoretically you would get your taste preferences kind of calibrate them to make sure they are consistent with what you like and then once you get radiation or chemotherapy if you did have an insult either during or afterward there's plenty of data that shows you know the cachexia is the term they use with malnutrition when it comes to cancer, like as you know, survival outcomes yeah. and response outcomes, that then it can hopefully maintain or at least bolster that, you know, through the entire chemotherapy process. But even afterward, just really change your distribution. I mean, theoretically, which I know you're a very, you know, tight conservative as far as like academic stuff goes, like, you know, you don't say anything until it's proven. But theoretically, you know, if there's a way to stimulate the innate response during this scary, you know, flu season or vaccine season, yeah. or sorry, COVID season, especially because our patients need treatments and they're around a whole bunch of other people that are also innate immunity yeah. compromised, it's literally the worst circumstance. You almost have this like incubation of multiple people that sadly are going through something very scary and all, you know, compromised to some degree with their treatments, all having to stay together. There's no time off, right? Like the treatments to be able yeah. to hopefully you know, at least stimulate something with a nasal spray or whatever, uh, and then just go back, you know, to the roots, as we said at the beginning of this, to, to a simple way of how we understand things could um, potentially be a, you know, a huge upside to all that. Absolutely. I mean, it's why it's such a fascinating point of research, because you have something that seems so simplistic on the surface as a taste receptor, and you can use it to measure their specific phenotypic expression, right? To tailor diets, to, ta to tailor, you know, recommendations for, for different things that they intake, whether it be food or drinks. But then you also have the innate immune response that you can then have novel therapeutics to stimulate in a non-systemic and, and healthy way. And that's, that's why I said at the start of this, that it's such an incredible point I, do, I don't think it's the holy grail. I do want to say that. Like, I, I don't think it's the end all be all or the fountain of youth, but it, but it is such an incredible potential that we are sitting on the the front end of that I think will have such a big place in the future of medicine. And that's, that's really fascinating. 
Dr. Barham, thank you so much for being here. This is extremely fascinating. I'm glad, you know, something that's been around for, you know, at least a decade. I know you have publications for, from a decade ago, finally being dusted off and, and re-explored because I do believe, and I think many of our listeners do, that going back to natural, innate stuff when it comes to just like how our bodies behave and, and going back to the basics has a lot more answers than, than we've kind of paused to realize. Yeah, no, thank you so much for having me. This was fun.